So hello again, Andreas Colliger. I am the product manager for Neo4j Bloom. It is our graph visualization tool. I wanted to introduce you to Bloom, give a little tour of the features of Bloom, and do some walkthrough examples about how you might use Bloom on a day-to-day -day basis. As the, the title and a few variations on the title hint at, uh, we're interested in business views of the graph. That's the main point behind Neo4j Bloom. Why is graph visualization interesting in general? Graphs are inherently visual, of course. We, we always like to talk about the whiteboard friendliness of graphs. But is that really enough to actually motivate like building a graph visualization tool? There's plenty of vendors outside who have fantastic applications. Um, what are people doing with these graph visualizations? One way to think about graph visualization is that it is a, a thinking tool. If you've seen mind map tools, those are just graphs. Those are small scale graphs that people put together to help think through some domain. You're like, OK, now we've got some stuff. I want to figure out what's related to that stuff. And maybe you're making out a plan for, or maybe you're planning a wedding or something. You want to find, figure out you know, all the things you've got to have in sequence, all the things that have to happen before other things, all these complex dependency trees. Might just be a little mind mapping exercise. And that's, that's a graph visualization. You might be building an application with Neo4j. You might be building uh, some sort of master data management tool or some logistics planning tool or some fraud analysis. And if you're building an application, you're storing data inside of Neo4j. It's helpful to be able to just see the stuff that you're storing to make sure that it looks the way you think it does so that when you're later trying to run some queries and maybe you're not getting the responses that you think you should, seeing the data helps you understand how you should write your queries. And so being able to visualize the data um, is of course helpful just as a development tool. And going a little bit away from developers, uh, communication tool for describing a scenario. This is a little bit, uh, I guess, going back to even to the mind mapping to some extent. But you see in newspapers more and more frequently uh, scenarios portrayed as like, here's all the players that are involved. Here's all the things that they've done together. We saw in all the talks, of course, this morning, uh, already just during the keynote, lots of graphs being used to ex actually explain things. Hillary talked about graphs as a way of having different kinds of metaphors for explaining situations. Graph visualization, of course, is critical for that. So as just a communication and then also a presentation tool, a fantastic use of graph visualization. And if you have data, if it's not just an infographic, if the data is live, well, it's not just that you can show people, here's what my scenario looks like. The scenario can be a live scenario that you can actually walk through, that you can explore. That you can find how one part of the graph is related to some other part of the graph and maybe discover things you didn't know that was there. So the graph itself becomes the tool for actually doing some useful work. And this is a bit more traditional in terms of data visualization, is that you might be interested in actually graph visualization because what you want to do is traditional business intelligence. You want to be able to look at all the data that you have in the graph, but still do normal BI type things. You want to be able to have uh, charts in addition to your graphs, and maybe some pie charts, maybe some line charts, and see summaries of the data that's there, and get some business insight out of that. And going a little bit further past that, and being a bit more analytical about it, if you're a data scientist, you go past just making bar charts. You actually want to be able to have deep understanding of the data, where you're looking at the entire graph or different communities within the graph. You, be, you want to be able to understand all the different communities that are there, and maybe how those communities relate to one another. Um, who's the most important person in this graph? What are the most important groups within this graph? How is this graph possibly going to actually evolve based on the structures that you've analyzed? So having a, both a, a deep and broad understanding of the graph is easier when you can actually see things. You can do the analysis. You can just you know, have the analysis pump out some result. But doing some analysis that then decorates the graph that you can then visualize is the best way to actually understand what the analysis is telling you. So that's great. There's lots of different reasons why you might be interested in graph visualization. If you want to do graph visualization today, you have many nice choices. There are uh, lovely partners and friends outside who have fantastic tools that you can take a look at. These are some of those tools. We, we, we love these folks. These, these are feature-rich, mature tools that do all kinds of great things with graph visualization. Friends like Luxurious, people like Keylines and Tom Sawyer have been at it for a while. Toolkits like Wireworks, if you want to build your own diagramming tool that is really a graph visualization tool, but maybe custom built for a particular application you're trying to build. All kinds of great things are out there. New players like Kinevis, which is 
Uh, I haven't gotten a chance yet to even go to their booth, but I knew that they were going to be here. I'm excited just to see what they've been doing. They're doing stuff in a 3D space with graphs, which is going to be really exciting, as I'm hoping that they're also going to show off some VR, maybe some AR type tools, because that would be super cool. I just love the idea of being able to walk through a graph and grab nodes and move them around, maybe clank them together. I'm not sure if that's what their plan is, but I'm hoping. And of course, if you're familiar with Neo4j, you know that by far the most powerful tool for graph visualization is our own Neo4j browser. I think you'll agree. It's a rather fine tool. It comes built into Neo4j. Um, it's built for Neo4j, of course, and it has a modest amount of graph visualization you can do. So if you're comfortable writing some cipher, you can see the results of that cipher as a graph of a few you know, dozen nodes or so. Neo4j browser works just fine. And it's a fantastic way to actually you know, do work with Neo4j if you are a developer. Uh, but graphs are useful for more than just developers. The, the list of things we went through earlier, which talked about different ways to think about doing graph visualization, why you might be interested in graph visualization, only one of those was talking about why developers are interested. If you've got data in the graph, if your organization has data in the graph, probably more than just the particular application that you have in mind, that there are more people in your organization who might be interested in seeing that data, working with that data, but not writing Cypher in order to do so. So what do we do for those folks? We decided that what we could do, what there was an opportunity for us to do, is to add a feature to Neo4j Enterprise Edition. Neo4j Enterprise Edition is the full, complete package of Neo4j with all the stuff that we can put together in a, in a, a deliverable that is useful out of the box. So let's add something to Neo4j Enterprise Edition that does graph visualization, that lets anybody who's interested in data inside of the graph use that data in the graph, work with that data inside of the graph, maybe even edit that data inside of the graph. And so we designed and built Neo4j Bloom. Imagine I just double clicked on that. And then Bloom comes up, and of course, this tells you the, the name of the the product is, is a giveaway here. We, we saw it in the keynotes earlier today as well. One of the most fun things to do with Neo4j Bloom is have these lovely blooming uh, graphs full of, of nodes. Like There's lots of like subgraphs in here, of course, where you can see different clusters within uh, this particular visualization. This data set here I was pulling from the ICIJ. Uh, and these are just officers and the addresses that they were using. And even just looking at this, maybe from the back of the room, this looks just like a, a, a hairball. That's one of the other popular things to call large graph visualizations is a hairball. Didn't sound quite as good as a product name, so we thought mm, maybe not call it Neo4j hairball. Instead, it's Neo4j bloom because it sort of blossoms out from the middle. Um, looking at this, you can easily identify, I think, probably that, okay, fine, there's a big hairball, but then there's parts of this hairball that are really interesting. There's that part on the right there that is clearly a cluster of activity where there's something going on there. If you're doing a fraud investigation, that's probably a good place to kind of zero in and start to expand your investigations around. A lot of this seems like it's fairly innocent stuff. I mean, this is the ICAJ Paradise Paper, so lots of the stuff that's in there is just perfectly legitimate. It's not fraudulent activity. It's just normal day-to-day -day business stuff. But if you're looking for where there might be some fraud, you look for where there's a highly connected parts of the graph, and then you do some more exploration there, and then you can actually write some great journalistic investigative uh, reporting. So. That's one of the things you can do with Neo4j Bloom. Uh, as far as the feature set that we have um, out of the box, Neo4j Bloom in the, in the 1.0 release, we started because we are, we're still a database company, right? That's, that's our DNA, that's how we think about things. So the first thing we thought about when we thought about, okay, we're gonna build a graph visualization tool is, what's the data model actually look like? Sure, the data model is the Neo4j property graph, but if we wanna have the Neo4j property graph, available to everyday users, they don't necessarily know what labels are or what the relationship types are. Um, you all know that when you're building data applications with Neo4j, you've got a convention for when you use this particular kind of relationship type with this kind of label, you have actually in your mind a business view of the graph or an application view of the graph that is represented inside of the property model but is distinct. It's similar to what happens in the relational world where in the relational world you have a conceptual model which is the business view of the problem domain, but then you've got the physical model of how you actually break that down into tables and foreign key relationships and things like that. Business users don't care about the foreign key relationships. They care about the business entities. They care about that conceptual model that you started with. 
That's our starting point with Neo4j Bloom. That's our focus for Neo4j Bloom, is have a data model that recaptures some of that business view of the graph that is there that's implicit in the actual graph that you have, in the labels and the relationship types and even the property keys that you have, but that actually re, kind of recaptures the business entities and focuses on the business entities themselves. So that's our starting point. To that, we then uh, realized that, uh, well, we're technologists, we love writing code, and what would be a graph visualization without being GPU powered? The maths involved in doing uh, the, the physics layouts and even doing the kind of rendering that we want to be able to do really requires GPU power to actually do properly. So of course we built our own GPU accelerated visualization engine for both doing the rendering but also for doing the physics uh, calculations involved. Uh, it wouldn't be a graph interactive environment if you couldn't interact with the environment. So a basic thing of course you can do is you can uh, interact with the nodes, you can move them around, you can explore through the graph directly just by pointing and clicking, no code required of course. Um, and if you want to, there's two complementary views that are actually really uh, helpful together. The graph itself is fantastic when you're just exploring, when you want to see overall structures, you want to see neighborhoods of things, but sometimes you actually want to have a bit more of a web browser view of things. This, this had come up earlier on when we had first did, done our market research on uh, building a tool. And one of our customers said actually what they would most want to have for a graph visualization tool is something that allowed them to look through their bill of materials and then page through from the bill of materials to other bill of materials that are related to that. They wanted a drill down view. They almost really wanted a web browser view of the graph. They just wanted to look through all the details. So in addition to the graph structural view with all the nodes, the classic circles and lines that everybody does, we also fundamentally have this uh, detail view that we're calling a card view that has the node and relationship details and that you can browse the graph through that as well. You can kind of switch between the two modes of operating and they work really well together. And again, because this is uh, the fundamental way of interacting with the graph, it's nice to be able to explore the graph, but if you are a user who has uh, the rights and the need to actually edit the graph, you have basic graph editing capabilities. You can change property values, you can create nodes, you can create relationships, and of course remove them as well. So that this becomes potentially all you need is to create some data, put it in Neo4j, use Neo4j Bloom, and you already have applications, useful things you can do because the data itself is the application, the graph is the application. And this final bullet, actually the, the, this first one and the last one, the graph perspective and this near natural language search, these we feel are like the, the defining product features of what Neo4j Bloom is, how it's different from other graph visualization uh, products that are available, and the things that we wanna focus on. And again, because we're Neo4j, the database company, these will of course reflect our own heritage. This is where our sweet spot is, this is what we feel we do the best. We understand how people model data inside of graphs because we've been doing that for well over a decade now, and we also understand how to find stuff within a graph, that how you actually query a graph with our cipher query language that we invented that's now becoming an industry standard through lots of different uh, international standards processes. We want to extend that and make that available to just normal everyday users. We thought the way to do that is with a near natural language search. And I'm gonna focus on these last two points a little bit more just to actually explain exactly what I'm talking about there. So for the graph perspective, again, this is a business view of the graph. This is uh, defined by what are the node labels you have, what are the property keys that you have, categorizing those into business entities, and then how those business entities, of course, are related to another, each other. That's the fundamental idea that we have, is that like, we wanna recapture this business view, and then that's the primary way that you actually interact with the graph. This is useful because while you might start, as, as Emily pointed out earlier, many of our customers start out with having a very specific problem that they're trying to solve. They come to Neo4j, they come to graphs because they've got a query problem that some query doesn't run very fast. They think that Neo4j is gonna run that query faster, so some, some of their data moves over to Neo4j. Or they have a very specific domain problem that is really a graph problem, and they move that data over to Neo4j, and they, they have a, a graph application there. But if you have any data inside of a database, whether it's Neo4j or anywhere else, it's usually more useful than just a single application. There are probably multiple users of that data who would love to have access to that data. So with these business views, the other nice part about this is that you can abstract a business view that has different perspectives. So you can have the departmental views, one for HR, one for the sales team. They can all be looking at the same data, but looking at what they care about within the data or what they're allowed to see within that data. 
So if you're concerned about being able to hide personally identifying information for compliance reasons, you could use a perspective to actually hide the data that people shouldn't be able to look at. Or if you want to give your developers, again, being sensitive to personal data, if you want to obscure all the data from them, they could have just a purely structural view. They could have, through this perspective, a view that sees only the nodes and the relationships, but none of the content. It would just be a purely structural view of the graph. All this is possible by having this abstraction on top of the property graph model, which we're calling a perspective view. The other feature that I mentioned is, is this near natural language search. And this actually started from uh, the same observation that we've always you know, said uh, about graphs being very whiteboard friendly. One aspect of being whiteboard friendly, it's very visual, that's very nice. But another aspect of whiteboard friendly is generally when you've gone with a colleague, you've gone to a whiteboard and you've written something down with some circles and some lines, the kinds of structures that you've created, the kinds of names you've given things, both to the circles and to the lines, you could actually just read out loud and they form somewhat coherent sentences, sometimes. Uh, often the labels will end up being noun type things, the relationships will be like uh, verb type things or, or um, sometimes attribute type, uh, type names. And yet, you can find one part of the graph and just go from a node to a relationship to a node to a relationship and have this somewhat stilted grammar that you could just speak out loud, fill in a couple extra words of the and an and here and there, and becomes a language. That was our starting point for the near natural language search. We realized that all graphs, the graph data itself, is really a dictionary that you could take advantage of for expressing a grammar that you could then use for searching. So if you've got data that makes sense because of how you've labeled it, how the property keys you've got, and of course what the data itself actually is, we just use that as a dictionary for actually producing a natural language that we can parse so that somebody who's not familiar or comfortable with Cypher can just type in something that looks like you know, what they might type into Google search. So if you're comfortable doing a Google search, rather than Google being the knowledge graph of the, of the web, we wanna be the knowledge graph for all graphs uh, that are using Near4j. To that, we also add two other ways of searching. Uh, the search everywhere here is really what, what uh, was mentioned earlier about full text search. Philip was talking about full text search coming in Neo4j 3.5. We're of course gonna take advantage of that inside of Neo4j Bloom, so that if you don't quite know what the structure of the graph is, you're just looking for, well, in this example of Tom Hanks, you can just type in Tom Hanks, hit return, we'll go ahead and look through the entire graph and find wherever Tom Hanks shows up. And if you have some experts in your, uh, uh, in your area that are familiar with Cypher, a little bit more comfortable with Cypher, they can actually augment these perspectives that you have. So once you've defined a business view, in addition to defining what's visible through that business view, you can write searches that are particular to that business view, where somebody could have idiomatic phrases that make sense for the HR department or for the sales department, and then have those be parameterized so that anything you can write in Cypher can receive a parameter and a normal human being can go to our uh, Bloom search type in the appropriate phrase, give the right kinds of values, the software gets executed, you get the results, you look like a genius. I'm gonna walk through both of those ideas uh, using the Northwind example. If you've used Neo4j, and I, I know that most of you here have, you know that out of the box we've got really two data sets that we have kind of baked into Neo4j's browser. Um, you can use the movie data set, which I referred to earlier with the, with the Tom Hanks examples. There's also this Northwind example, which is a bit uh, uh, older example, a bit more business friendly, and has a very convenient feature. This is a very rough schema of the, the Northwind uh, uh, relational database. It's a fictional company called Northwind that has some products that are in some categories that they sell to customers that are shipped via some shippers. Uh, and that's pretty much it. It's not a very complex domain but it's a reasonable you know, way to actually think about things. What's fun about this domain is that you, even just looking at this schema, you realize that some of these things are very closely related, like the orders and the order details are kind of the same thing and different in kind than the employees and the territories. Even just kind of eyeballing the different tables you have here, you realize that there are actually different parts of the schema that you, you could draw boxes around and realize that those are actually different business entities. That's one of the things we want to be able to capture. Looking at that Northwind schema as a Northwind graph, it might look something like this. This is a screenshot of, of uh, Neo4j Bloom showing a sampling of that data set, roughly positioned about the same way that the schema was laid out so that you can see the categories of the nodes that are products. Those products, we didn't do any change to the data set. We let the order details still be separate nodes. We didn't optimize that away to be just a relationship. Um, 
the order details that go over to a green order that get, then goes to some purple shipping company. All the same data is there, but now it's in the graph. And now that it's in part of the graph, you can actually explore this data in a really nice way. So if you happen to work for the Northwind purchasing department, you might get only a subset of that data. You might be able to only see the things that you need to, uh, to know about so that you know what to buy, so that you always have stuff on the shelves so that your salespeople can sell it. So you need to know the categories of things, the products that are in those categories, and then who the suppliers are. The rest of the graph is dark to you because that's not stuff that's important for you to know. And if this is a perspective that somebody has built for you, you could do something like this. This is an example of that somewhat stilted grammar that I was talking about. This is beverages, product suppliers. Okay, maybe not something that comes up in conversation, but you could probably figure out what that means. I'm gonna find the suppliers of these beverages, um, right, any products that are beverages. If we tried to run that in Bloom, and let's see if you can see this detail. We type it out, and as it's getting typed out, we're doing a bunch of different analysis on what you're typing, trying to figure out what different graph patterns that might actually equate to based on what we know about the graph. And we realized that for this graph pattern, it was actually just um, suppliers, product category, and then the products that are in that category. We figured out what that was, figured out how to write the cipher for that, ran the cipher, got the results back, and then there's a the result. This is a bit more natural thing to say if you were somebody who was uh, uh, doing purchasing decision decisions um, here, products ordered with pavlova, pavlova, which is a, a delicious thing. Um, you might, if you're in the purchasing department, it might be helpful to know that when people order pavlova, that they order other things. So that if you know you need to reorder the pavlova, maybe you also wanna reorder those other things. So what are the products that are ordered with pavlova? A simple question to ask. It's actually the kind of thing that you could imagine people typing into Google if they thought Google knew about that kind of stuff. But instead, you would just type it here into NFJ Bloom. Bloom tries to figure out what graph patterns it might actually be. And because there are relationships between the products that are ordered together, we find both Pavlova, the products that are related to Pavlova, it comes together back in one big tree. This uh, structural view of the graph again, oh, and actually, I don't remember if I let the video clip go on or not. No, I think I edited this back. So we'll go to one of the other clips that shows the, the, the graph detail view. Oh, which is this one, of course. This is an unparameterized query entirely. This is something you might just run on a, on a weekly or monthly basis. You can turn to Bloom and say, okay, what am I low on the stock on? And it'll just run a query and show you the results. So this is just gonna go through all the products and figure out, okay, for all the products, we know what the reorder levels are, we know what the current stock is, let's find the things that are below the reorder level and go ahead and get them. And here I've opened up the, the side detail view, which lets me scroll through all of the nodes that are on the screen. And if I want to, I could double click on any of those cards and see all of the details about what that product is. Okay, I'm gonna go through a couple different views uh, from different departments. Uh, this, instead of being in the purchasing, if you're in the shipping department, the same kinds of ideas apply. Now you can see things like you can see the order details, you can see the product, but not the categories, not who the suppliers are, because your only job is to figure out, okay, this customer ordered this thing, where it, they asked for it to be shipped by this shipper, let's go ahead and fulfill what those things are. So if you want to know who all the shippers are, who are shippers of orders to the ship city of Portland, which is fun because it's also kind of a, Portland is actually a shipping city, it's not just where you ship through, it's also got shipping. Anyway, much like New York. You could enter that into Neo4j Bloom. It'll go off, it'll figure out what the patterns are, it'll find you what the results are, so you can find out all the people who are shippers for the city of Portland. We do a bit of the graph pattern matching, we figure out what the graph pattern is, and there are the results. And let's see if I can click through here. So, you can also ask things who are the most popular shippers. And these queries that I'm entering here, this is a combination of graph pattern queries plus also extended custom search phrases. The custom search phrases become really exciting because once you start realizing the fun things you can do with Cypher, coming up with phrases that make it easy to just run those whenever you want to is really fantastic. As you add more and more phrases, you end up with this phrase book that basically lets you pop open Bloom in the morning, connect to the graph that you want to use and just get all kinds of useful things done just by you know, calling out these phrases. Not in the 
maybe not even in the 1.1 or 1.2, but eventually this ends up leading towards like a chatbot-like experience where we could have actually voice recognition, you could talk to Bloom, we will be able to find things. You could just be getting your morning coffee and, and asking Bloom about stuff about the graph and like we'll, we'll find the results. Maybe I'll get together with the VR guys, we'll have a VR environment where you can talk to it and you can see the graph results. We'll see what we can work out. Okay, another example from the sales department. We'll go through this one. This one's a little bit fun just because uh, if you're a salesperson, this is your version of doing a recommendation query. So when, uh, uh, I think it was Emil who had mentioned about Amazon doing recommendations, that's fantastic for consumers. But there's also a sales equivalent of that, that like if you've got somebody who's buying something from you, you wanna figure out what else you can sell them while their wallet's open, right? So this is an incredibly important question to ask. What can I cross sell if somebody is already buying Boston crab meat? As a graph query, it's pretty simple. And as a Bloom search, it's even simpler. So you just start typing in, mistyping, retyping, and finally you get the phrase right. Cross sell, you see that one of the completion options is that crab meat was there. As we're doing the, the autocomplete, we both do com autocomplete of the phrase itself, but also for any property values that are possible that make sense within that phrase. I happened to see the uh, crab meat was there, and I was getting tired of being a bad typist, so I clicked on crab meat, and then I got the results. So we know that crab meat maybe is a good thing to cross sell along with, I'm not even sure what Sir Rodney scones are, I'm sure they're delicious and probably complement crab meat really nicely. Okay, I'm gonna go through two, two more examples just briefly. This is the most reduced view of the graph. Um, again, all, all the rest of the graph there is now completely darkened because if you're in the HR department, all that you really need to know is about the employees. All the sales stuff, all of the product stuff is not really relevant to you, so you don't have a view that can see that. All you can see is the employees and who they're related to, who the reports are. So if you're an HR person, you might wanna be able to run a query like this. Um, maybe you know, you've even taken the time to have this integrated with Slack. You could have Slack send over a message to Bloom and say, hey, tell me the employees who, or, who report to Fuller. And you just type that in. We realize that that's a nice uh, pattern match. And we find Fuller, we find the people that report to Fuller. Now I, I mentioned sort of offhand that like, this is the kind of thing you could imagine integrating with something like Slack. That's one of our goals with Bloom, is that we wanna have a baseline of, of features that are easy to integrate with any other environment that you might be in. One of the approaches that we wanna take with that is that we have this idea of deep linking, so that if you're using Neo4j Desktop, for instance, which is how Neo4j Bloom is delivered today, that Neo4j Desktop will be able to respond to URLs that will pull up Neo4j Desktop, and if you've asked for Neo4j Bloom, Neo4j Bloom can come up, and then the rest of the URL can actually pass through parameters like a search query to Bloom. So you could actually be in Slack, have somebody pop open a, uh, a Bloom query, click on it, there'll be some permissions checks of course, we won't just automatically run stuff, but then have Bloom find parts of the graph. You could actually use just this way of being able to search, have that in any kind of a Slack channel, have it in you know, messages, in WhatsApp, any, any other ways of communicating, and actually use that as a way of actually helping other people find stuff that you might have found in the graph. Okay, the, the last one that I'll mention here, and along with it, I'll mention another integration approach that we're, we're working towards. You can take all of this. It's useful for different departments within the organization. It's also useful for your end customers. Um, if you had your end customers, you want to give them access to the graph as well, well, they can ask, you know, if they happen to be on, if you had some iMessage integration or something, you could pass any of the questions they've asked on to Bloom as well, and you could ask questions about products and the categories that they're in. So you could ask, again, because Pavlova is fantastic, you could say, tell me what beverages go with Pavlova. And if you were just in New 4 Bloom itself, you would type that in, we would do the auto-completion. We'd go figure out, okay, let's find Pavlova, let's find the things that people buy when they buy Pavlova that are beverages, and let's show that graph. So here are all the beverages. There are some lovely Chartreuse Vert, some Ipo coffee, these things sound like they're fantastic with Pavlova. A, a steel ice stout, that's probably the best choice to go with the Pavlova. This is the kind of thing that you could eventually embed onto your website. So Neo4j Bloom, as we deliver today, is part of Neo4j Enterprise, gets delivered on Neo4j Desktop. It's an application that you add, it's what we're calling graph apps. 
Uh, it's one of a, a growing list of apps that are available inside of Neo4j Desktop. But that's the first place that we're starting. We want to be able to make Bloom available anywhere that you want to be able to use Bloom. So that means, in addition to the full capabilities of Bloom when it's inside of Desktop, having a reduced set of capabilities so that if this is a scene that you've captured here that has a constraint in this particular perspective, so this is the customer's perspective, you want to be able to give customers externally uh, access to Neo4j and Bloom's features, you should be able to take this, embed it inside of an iframe, and put it inside of your website with a little search box and have just that small part of the um, application available to you. They wouldn't get the card view, they wouldn't be able to define new perspectives, they wouldn't be able to do editing, but to be able to deliver some of this nice value that you've got, but on an external website. Okay, so our goal with Neo4j Bloom is that everyone who's got data inside of the graph should be able to access that graph, whether or not you know, they're comfortable writing any kind of cipher. And if they've got a friend who writes some cipher, then they can do even more fun things. And importantly, the kinds of work you can do is that you can, anybody should be able to search, anybody should be able to explore, and anybody who has the correct rights should also be able to edit the graph so that out of the box, when you've got Neo4j Enterprise plus Neo4j Bloom together, you pretty much have almost everything you need to do just for work with graphs. And of course, beyond that, you can build custom applications that you would then take Bloom, any of the capabilities you like that we've made integrated, integratable, embeddable, it's probably the better word, and take that forward into your own applications as well. So that's what we've got with Neo4j Bloom today. It's a graph application for everyday graph uses. I have some time, I think, for questions, yes? Yeah, okay. Does anyone have any questions? Sir. It's a great question. So all of the access control is actually managed by Neo4j itself. So Neo4j basically is the engine that is, that is powering Neo4j Bloom. We're augmenting Neo4j with uh, um, obviously the near natural, natural language search, also this abstraction layer, but that abstraction layer ultimately works through Neo4j itself. So all the access control is through Neo4j um, access rights. Josh. Sure, so uh, this is a bit of a novel use of Neo4j Desktop. So Neo4j Desktop started life, of course, as just a way to actually deliver Neo4j for personal use on your local laptop or your desktop, whatever personal computer you might have. Having built Desktop, we then realized it's a great way for also delivering things like Neo4j Browser. Once we could deliver Neo4j Browser, we thought, oh, we can deliver other applications like Neo4j Bloom this way. So what we're working towards is a way that uh, it's easy to install applications into Neo4j Desktop. For Neo4j Bloom, the way that works is that you actually need to get the software activation key. Once you've got the activation key, there's a place in Neo4j Desktop to add the activation key. Once that's been entered, Neo4j Bloom becomes available, and then you can install it and use it in, in anywhere inside of the desktop. So the activation keys right now are available as part of an enterprise trial. So if you're engaged with Neo4j itself uh, through one of our lovely sales representatives, you can ask them for access to Neo4j Bloom, and then they can get you a key for Bloom, um, and you can use it that way. We're working hard to make Bloom available to just about everybody, but right now we're kind of constrained through like the, our delivery model through, um, through the enterprise. And you've got a question, sir. Okay, I'll work backwards there. So uh, it does not work uh, very well on mobile at the moment. It's very click-based. Um, we're touch-aware, um, touch but not touch-optimized right now. So it's not a very good experience if you want to try to use this on an iPad or something like that. And certainly not on a mobile phone, of course. Um, works great on the Mac, works great on Windows. Also available um, on Linux. So if you have an Ubuntu install, you should be able to use Neo4j Desktop and Neo4j Bloom on Ubuntu, and it's great there. And um, Oh, and the editing capabilities that you've asked about. So the details about the editing capabilities are that you can do property-based editing. The properties that you can edit are constrained by the properties that have been made available through the perspective. So when you're defining the business view, you also define what um, properties are available to the user. They can only add those properties or remove those properties or change the value of those properties. Um, we don't yet have constraints on the kinds of nodes that you can create or the relationships that you can create, but that's something that's actually evolving as well. So if you've got 
um, particular interest in like how editing should work, this is a good time to tell us. Uh, this is actually a good time for any of you to tell me what you'd like to see out of what we've got now and what you'd like to see next. So if you've got ideas uh, about what kinds of areas we should focus on, please let me know because uh, I, I'm the person who's gonna have to try to deliver it back to you. We've got a few more minutes, please. Yeah. Right, so there's uh, two parts of that. So the deep linking integration is primarily for users who've got Neo4j desktop. So that would be people who have a, a full license for Neo4j Bloom um, and are using it on Neo4j desktop. If you have a broader number of users that are maybe uh, inside of the organization or even public facing, we have a different uh, tier that we're working towards. So that's once we can actually deliver embeddable web views, there'll be a different tier of pricing for those views. And uh, I, I guess I can't add any more details until we've actually figured out what that's gonna look like when we deliver it. Okay, so but it'll, it'll be different. So some parts of that are available today that you cannot, uh, so the deep linking today works in as much as that it actually will invoke Neo4j desktop and it'll pull up Neo4j Bloom. It doesn't yet pass forward any queries. It, there's actually no actions you can take through the deep linking. Deep linking was first actually something that came around um, when people were asking about how to use Neo4j Bloom uh, at the same time that they were using something like Tableau. And the obvious you know, answer was, okay, well, we can, we can export data from Neo4j into Tableau. You can see that there, that's great. But if you have a record in Tableau that you want to explore in Bloom, how do you work backwards? And so we thought, okay, great, we'll provide a URL. You could be in Tableau, click a web link that would call up desktop and then you can continue the work. Separately, if we, once we have embeddable web views and we have a way of hosting those web views, those will have share links that will be a little bit more similar to like if you were sharing images rather than deep links that actually trigger actions. And one last question, sir. It is, yeah, so it's very much the case that in Neo4j Bloom, while it is powered by Neo4j, we are operating at a slightly higher abstraction level where we're trying to recapture some of the semantics that are implicit inside of the graph. And so the business view and also the query language, as, as you correctly point out, operate at that level of interaction with the graph. We map to the property graph, we map to Cypher, but it's a, it's a higher abstraction. And in fact, for the near natural language search, the way that that's actually constructed, of course, is that we just do what you would normally do with natural language processing. We look at all the labels, the relationship types, the property keys, and some of the data, use that as a dictionary for feeding natural language processing, do some stemming on that so that we can have variations on plurals and singular, all those kinds of things. And that actually lets us then have uh, uh, the kind of near natural language search that I was demonstrating. Cool. I you can. So very last comment is that like, um, for the custom search phrases, anything that you can do in Cypher, so if you've got uh, APOC installed and you can call you know, APOC from within the Cypher, then you could actually have search phrases that call APOC that do things that then result in some graph visualization. Thank you, everybody. This is the end of my time. Thanks for staying with me. If you have any more questions, I'm gonna be downstairs at the dev zone where we have a Bloom demo booth set up. I'd love to show you a little bit more about what we've got, and I'd love to hear your ideas about what you wish we were doing. Thanks. Thank you.